All right. Thank you, Leon. If you have your Bibles, we'll turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. If you will be turning there, it was a big night for us. I shared, we moved here four and a half years ago, so we moved in the middle of uh, my kids were in the middle of 10th grade and 6th grade. So imagine sort of a change of life during those times, suddenly a new school, new church, new setting, moving away from family that we've been around all our lives. And one of, the, one of the things that I think we verbally said was that it could be that God would let us come here because he may, have, he may help to set our kids up to help them meet the, the spouses that he would one day have them to, to know and to love and to, uh, to begin life with. And so to see that come to fruition in my son's life and be able to celebrate with him last night was a lot of fun. We love Amy and the Rayleigh family and very thankful for for them, excited to make this journey and thankful that they have the support of a church like this to love them and walk with them through this season. And so, uh, so it was a big night. Yesterday, also, my daughter passed her driving test, so that was a miracle of God as well. So that may be bigger than the Tennessee win. I don't know, but it did. So we're, we're proud of her. It was a big day, a big day for the Kinlaw family, and so a big day for a lot of folks. A lot of talk about football. I want you to imagine for a moment that we all got on the bus today, and we went over to Tyner High School, and went out on the field of the Tyner Rams, and I stood out in the middle of that field with you with a football, and I put it in your hand, and I told you, go score a touchdown. No opposition, no defense, no one between you and the line. Just hand you the ball, and all you've got to do is cross the goal line, and you would get points. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I wonder how many of you could score a touchdown in that scenario. Like, I think unless you're, as long as you're, I mean, you wouldn't need special shoes or padding or anything else for that matter. As long as you're able-bodied, and even if you're mildly not able-bodied, you would have all the time and all that you would need. And you could easily, even with your walker in one hand and your football in the other, you could, almost anybody could score in those conditions. Now, imagine the same scenario. I hand you the football, and I say, go score a touchdown, and now all the Tyner defensive unit is out in front of you. You've suddenly got opposition in your way. You've got um, a group of 11 strong, healthy, powerful young men that are going to do everything they can to keep you from gaining a single yard, let alone from getting to the goal line. Now, under that scenario, I, I, again, I won't really ask you to raise your hand, but I wonder how many of us think that we could actually score a touchdown under those conditions. The difference is the, the reality, the position of opposition, that there we would have to deal with a defensive unit. There would be someone in the way who was seeking to stop us from accomplishing that goal of crossing the line. Oh, in this letter, we have been looking at this reality that, that God has called us to something powerful, something important. In fact, the, the theme verse of the first two chapters, it seems to be in chapter 2 and verse 2, where Paul talks about how he has received truth from God that he has poured into Timothy, who's now in his 30s or 40s. Paul is in prison. Paul is likely going to be put to death soon, martyred for his faith. And so he's calling on his young son of the faith, Timothy, to continue on the gospel ministry and to take this good news entrusted to him and entrusted in others who in turn entrusted into others so that the gospel work will continue. So the, the good work of God and the truth of who Jesus is and what he did on the cross and through his resurrection will continue to have its way in and through their lives so that God will continue to be glorified through changed hearts and change lives. And, and that sounds relatively simple on the surface because that's a sort of, a, it's sort of Paul's great commission calling. Take this good news and share it with others. It's the, it's the same call that all of us in the room have. And no matter what your vocation, no matter what your career, we are called as followers of Jesus to follow him and to help other people to know and follow him as well. And again, that sounds relatively simple. Just live your life Surrender to God in obedience to Scripture. Tell other people about Jesus. That sounds relatively simple until you realize that between you and living out that goal is a ton of opposition. In fact, there is a real enemy, and this comes up again and again and again. There is a real enemy who desires in Satan and in his, his demonic forces who desire to do all that they can to keep lost people from being saved and to keep saved people from growing in their faith. That there is a real power that is at work in every circumstance where the gospel is being lived and where the gospel is being proclaimed that wants to silence the gospel and to silence those who would stand for and live out that gospel. 
And he doesn't show up with a pointy tail and a pitchfork in hand and bright red makeup to say, here I am to sort of mess up your life. It's much more subtle than that. He he does so subtly through false teachers and and their teachings that seek to move us away from truth and and can even sound religious, sound spiritual, sound good, sound sound godly, might even quote some Bible verses along the way, but, but can be false teaching that would move us away from truth and away from Christ and away from God and move us farther and farther away so that, so that, again, so that those who are lost would never come to know Jesus. And so the, those who do know Jesus would not be growing in him and in such a way that we might be drawing others to him. There's, real, there's a real enemy. And again and again throughout this letter, Paul is speaking to this hard work that is involved in living and declaring the gospel in our lives. That, that there is a real enemy and that if we live in accordance with what God has spoken... If we take what is entrusted to us and steward it well, that we will be persecuted, we will be mocked, we will be ridiculed, we will be attacked, we will be rejected, we will be left out. But as we saw last week, Paul wants Timothy to know and he wants us to know that it is, it's worth it. It's worth it. And so our passage today, we're going to pick up at verse 14 as we're continuing our journey through this brief but very um, uh, powerful letter. But our passage for today speaks to these realities as Paul is continuing to encourage Timothy and us to to keep standing for truth, to keep living and sharing the gospel, to to keep investing in the next generation of believers, to to keep working hard in surrender to God, to to keep on um, embracing suffering if, if necessary so that through our lives we might combat the lies of the world and the attacks of Satan to help others to know and to love and to follow God and live according to his word. In short, we're we're calling today, they call it a sort of a great commission focus. A challenge of God, again, no matter what our vocation may be, that we are to live as men and women who are on mission, keeping our focus on Jesus and in his transforming good news and sharing that good news with others, even as, again, we face great opposition. Keep that in mind. Follow on with me. Chapter 2, 2 Timothy. Let's pick up at verse 14, and we'll look at uh, 14 through 19 today. Paul says, remind them, speaking of those believers that Paul was, or rather that Timothy is shepherding and leading in Ephesus, the church there, remind them of these things, these things he's just been speaking of, and we'll look at those again in a moment, and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of hearers, but be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal, two things. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from from wickedness. Here's what we're going to see today. There's a call here to stay focused on the truth, to avoid dangerous distractions, and to remain hopeful. Remind, stay focused on the truth, avoid dangerous distractions, remain hopeful in order to live out this great commission focus of following Jesus and helping others do the same. First of all, stay focused on the truth. With all these distractions that are pulling at our flesh, these worldly teachings and ideas and the culture around us, it is easy to get diverted, it is easy to get distracted, it is easy to find ourselves, rather than building our lives on the foundation of God's word, to build it on man-made ideologies and thoughts and religious views and perceptions and ideas. And so Paul says, in, because we have these constant threats, because of this constant pull, because of this constant um, barrage of opposition, we must continually remind those under our our care under our shepherding of truth. He says, remind them, and that, again, it's a command and it is habitual, ongoingly, continually, remind them, those under your care, Timothy, of these things. Of what things? Well, the things that we saw last week in verses 11 through 13, where he says these are, are, these are truisms, these are truths that they would have spoken within the church, maybe even sang as a part of their songs in the church, as a continual reminder of these powerful truths, things like the fact that we belong to God, that, that we will endure and reign with him, that even when we have momentary 
very faithlessness, our God remains faithful. He says, Timothy, you need to continually remind yourself and remind those around you of, of these things. That, that with these false teachers at work and with all the voices in the culture, there are lots of things seeking to pull you aside and to pull you away. And so you're going to have to continually work at You're going to have to invest yourself fully in continually reminding yourself, reminding others of the truth of the word of God. Do not get distracted. So he charges them, remind them of these things and solemnly charge them. And the word in there is the idea of a keep warning them not to engage in these, notice, not to engage in these word battles, to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of believers. The word ruin there is the word from which we get our word for catastrophe. Again, this is hard work. He says, encourage God's people not to get sucked into these discussions and these debates about things that do not build up, that do not edify, that do not encourage, that do not breathe life, that do not point people to the truth. You, you, we, we cannot afford to get sucked into these debates and these things that only, in, all, in essence, many times lead simply to more confusion and more doubt and more discouragement. That if they buy into these false teachings, then it will simply move them further away from God, further into disobedience. And so keep reminding them and keep warning them. Keep reminding them and warning them, reminding them, remind them of truth, warn them against getting caught up into these foolish and non-edifying discussions and debates. At the same time, Timothy, that you're doing that in the life of others, here's what you need to be doing in your own heart. Verse 15, be diligent, zealous, persistent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Now, it's easy for us to think of Timothy as a workman. He's a, he's a pastor. He's, a, he's In essence, he's the pastor of the first community church of Ephesus at the time. We, we might acknowledge him easily. Okay, he's a workman, but, but what does that have to do with you or me? Again, whatever your, call, whatever your vocation may be, whatever your career may be, whatever you're going to get up and give your time and effort and energy to tomorrow, whether you're a student or whether you're a plumber or whether you're an electrician or whether you're a truck driver or whether you're a retired person or whatever, the, whatever your vocation or career, your calling is to live for God and for the glory of God, to point others to God, to, to, to acknowledge that God has placed you where you are and you might not want to be there. You might not like your job and you may not like living in the city where you are and you may not care for the people around you, but God has uniquely called you and placed you there in order to use your life to help point those around you to Jesus, to help remind them of truth, to warn them against getting drawn away, to point them to the good news of the gospel. But if you're going to be faithful as a workman for the glory of God, and he uses words and thoughts here like being diligent, Working hard for the approval of God rather than man. Accurately handling the word of God. These are, these are things that involve the investment of time and energy and heart and focus and study and growth. These are the very things that as a body we, we seek to live out, don't we? To accurately handle the word and whether it's someone in the pulpit or someone in a small group, whether it's someone teaching children or whether it's someone with senior adults or anywhere in between. Our passion, our goal is as a church that, that whether it is in this setting or a small group setting or a one-on-one -on -one setting, that we are accurately handling the word of God. That we are faithfully acknowledging and knowing and understanding and speaking the word of God into the lives of those around us. That we have not been sucked away, we have not been drawn aside, we have not been overwhelmed by false teachers and their teachings. But that we know the truth, that we are living the truth, that we are speaking the truth. So Paul says, Timothy, it seems to me there's a call to sort of this, this continual self-examination. Timothy, I want you on a regular basis to stop and ask, am I living as a diligent workman of God? Do I accurately handle the word of God? Do I live with an eternal perspective that, that isn't just caught up in this moment, but that sees in the grand scheme of my life that I exist and I am here to be used by God to help other people to know and to follow Jesus Christ? That, that's not just a, an examination for Timothy in his day. That's an examination for Brian in this day and for you in your hearts today. 
Are you reminding those around you of truth? Are you avoiding getting sucked into the sorts of battles and debates that go nowhere and help no one? Are you, are you living in such a way and are you living your life based on the word of God in such a way that, that you are uh, stand not ashamed before God but approved before God as a man or woman who's living for his glory and for his purpose? There, there are all sorts of distractions. There are all sorts of dangers around us. And so we must remain focused. We must stay focused on the truth and help those around us to do the same But then notice, secondly, not only must we stay focused on the truth, but he said we must avoid dangerous distractions. Satan wants to distract us away from God, away from his word, away from our calling. And so Paul warns, verse 16, avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and as a result, then, they upset the faith. They, in the word in there is literally, they ruin the faith of some. In, in a world both then and now, some people don't accurately handle the word of truth. Many people distort it, twist it, add to it, add their own philosophies, their own rules, their own regulations, their own ideas, misrepresenting the nature of God, misrepresenting the, 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 the nature of salvation, misrepresenting the, the very character of God. And so Jesus says that we must stay focused on the truth of God and, and the gospel, by, and we are to, again, continually, habitually avoid or shun worldly and empty chatter. That, that word worldly there is the idea of that which is unconcerned with godliness, profane. It's the idea of those who would try to find truth in life without looking to the word of God for that truth. And the word empty there is the idea of useless or aimless. There's a lot of what is being talked about, a lot of what is written in books, a lot of what is put on podcasts, a lot of what is on the internet today that is aimless, that is useless, that is empty, that is not life-giving, that is not edifying, that is not affirming, that is destructive and is distracting. And Paul says anything that would distract your heart away from God and away from his word is to be avoided, is to be shunned, is to be, is to be moved away from, is to be acknowledged for the danger that it it is so that you might move it out of your life. I think that for some of us, that could be a, a warning that there could be some things that you are watching, some things that you are listening to, some people that you are, you are taking advice from, some people that you are following their ideas and their philosophies that, that are not moving you toward Jesus, that are not moving you toward God's word, that are not moving you towards truth, that are moving you toward man-made and fleshly ideas. And Paul says, the moment you acknowledge it for what it is, then you need to shun it. You need to avoid it. You need to address it because it is leading you astray. He says, because these sorts of things, this worldly, this empty chatter, leads to further ungodliness. It leads to progress, but the only progression that you're making is to become more, less moving away from God and to become more worldly. That empty and useless chatter, those false teachings and teachers that sound high-minded and spiritual and philosophical and religious and, and, and as if they have good advice for you, but, but truth, supposed truth is not rooted in what we know to be true that God has spoken. Those things are aimless and they are dangerous and they are distracting. And so he says you are to avoid them, you are to shun them because if you buy into them, they will simply move you farther and farther away from God, farther and farther away from truth, more and more after the pattern of the world around you. And if you stand up against that, then you will be mocked and you will be ridiculed and you will be called names and you will be rejected and you will not be invited to some things. And there will be those, even those who at times are closest to you, who will reject you. Paul says it is of critical importance that we That we do this because if not, we will find ourselves drifting farther and farther. And he says these sorts of man-made teachings, these sorts of um, unbiblical, ungodly um, talks and, and interactions have a way that are, they are contagious and they spread like gangrene. 
Now, we don't hear a lot about that disease in our, in our day because they have um, things that can combat that. But it was, in essence, a, a, um, a, a, an infection, a, a bacterial infection that would eat away at the flesh of a person. And I saw some pictures this week of it, and it is, it is horrific looking when you see the, the, the um, skin and, the, um, and the, 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 of the hands, a lot of times the feet that would, that would become dark and then in many cases would have to be amputated and oftentimes would simply lead to death. But the point that he's making is that it is infectious, it spreads, it is contagious, it will find its way, if it finds its way into your body, then it will not stop until it is removed, it is destructive. And Paul says that such is the nature of false teaching, that when false teaching, when lies, when unbiblical um, ideas are given root in our hearts and we begin to buy into them, then it's not only that we're leading ourselves astray, but that those who are following us, those who are learning from us, those who are, are following our example, those who are watching our lives, that they are being led astray as well. I cannot tell you, men and women, how many times I've seen that Someone in a family, and usually a mom or a dad, who gets distracted away from biblical truth and away from Christ and begins to buy into more worldly ideas and philosophies. And before you know it, both the husband and wife are moving in that direction, and then the kids and the whole family are moving in that direction. And sometimes they'll even have extended family who will join them in moving in that direction, moving farther and farther away from God, farther and farther away from truth, building their life more and more on the ideals of the world, destroying not only themselves but destroying the people around them. I must guard my heart. I must guard my life. I must guard my thinking. I must be mindful of what I am believing and what I'm buying into because not only does it affect me, it doesn't just affect Brian, but whatever I begin to buy into is going to affect my wife, Buffy. It's going to affect my kids. It's going to affect those who are under my care and under my leadership and under my shepherding. And under, so I must guard my own heart. I must keep it in check. I must remind myself of truth. And I must shun or avoid those things that are dangerous. And he gives an example here in verses 17 and 18. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. Men who have gone astray from the truth, they themselves have, and they've led others, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. Now, Hymenaeus is a, is a rare name in the New Testament, and so this is likely the same guy who's mentioned in the first letter to Timothy, in 1 Timothy 1.20, that Paul said was excommunicated from the church because of his false teaching. And so even though he's removed from that local body, he still is causing trouble. He still is creating issues in the life of that church and in that community at Ephesus. And Philetus is joining him in this. And in some way, they're still speaking about spiritual things. They're still talking about biblical things. They're still talking about religious things. But they are doing it in a way that is inconsistent with what God has revealed in his word. They are saying that the resurrection has already taken place. Now, he's clearly not talking about the resurrection of Jesus. He's talking about that of believers. And so they either were teaching that the, the resurrection is only a spiritual reality, that, that we're not physically resurrected, They're not a, there's not a bodily resurrection to come, or they were teaching that the resurrection has already occurred in the sense that, that, um, that we are now already living in the millennial kingdom and the believers are looking around and this doesn't look like what God has said this millennial kingdom would look like. But whatever the nature of this this, this false teaching is, it has caused upset or ruin for, for some. It has led some people further away from responding to God and surrender and salvation. It has led some who were believers farther away from God as they buy into these lies. They are progressing in worldliness, not in holiness. And so, again, he is warning here. That, yes, there's hard work involved. Yes, there is suffering that may come. But our faithfulness to God and his word and, and our fulfillment of the great commission of taking what has been entrusted to us and entrust that truth to others is, is we must, re to do that, we must remain focused. We must remain steadfast because the stakes are high, because the failure to do so brings great danger, not only for us, but for those who are, who are watching us. To turn from the word of God and get distracted by worldly ideas means leading us farther away from intimacy with God and the life that would glorify him, but also leading others to follow us into our sinfulness and brokenness. And so to be used of God to see people saved by Jesus and growing in him 
We must continually focus on the truth from God. We must avoid the dangerous distractions of false teachings and debates that move us away from that truth. But then notice a third reality here, a third call. If we're going to live out this great commission focus, this life that is committed to this call and of being used by God to see others know, find, and follow Christ. He says, remain hopeful in verse 19. Because given all the distractions, given all the dangers, given all the false teachers, given all the things that are out there, then we may question, well, what hope do we have? It's sort of like, again, being on that football field and handing you the ball, and you've got 11 big, grown, strong men standing there, standing in opposition. What hope do you have to get that ball across the line? It, it, would, seem, it would seem pretty low. And for these believers, that, as Paul is writing to Timothy and to those who hear this letter, it, it could be that to hear these things would be to wonder, well, what hope do we have? Like, what hope do we have that we can remain true? What hope do we, can we have that we're going to actually impact our culture given all the distractions and all the challenges and all the dangers and all the opposition that is in front of us? But it gives us all the hope we need in verse 19. Nevertheless, despite these dangers and these threats and these distractions that abound... The firm foundation of God stands having this seal. It's twofold. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. Here's what he says. The foundation of the true church, of those who belong to Jesus, the, the foundation of Jesus' church is firm, is solid, is immovable, is never in doubt. It is unbreakable. It is unshakable. It remains standing. You can attack it. You can, you can, you can, there can be all kinds of things being said, all kinds of things being taught, all kinds of distractions that abound, but the church of Jesus Christ stands firm. Now, that doesn't mean that a local church can't be in danger. That doesn't mean that some local churches won't close their doors. That doesn't mean that some churches can't get distracted and pulled aside and that, that local gathering of believers might have to close the doors of that facility. It happens around us. It happens all the time. But the true church, the church, capital C, the people of God, the body of Christ, is never in danger, is never in doubt, is never questionable about our survival or our success or our strength or our, our remaining true to God or our making it safely home because, he says, we ha it has this seal. This foundation that we are being built upon has a seal. And in that culture, that seal would be a, it would state the owner of that facility. Maybe the purpose of that facility would be etched into a stone, into the foundation of that building. Into the foundation of the church of Jesus Christ that as believers we're a part of are etched these two truths. This seal declaring these two realities. One, that God owns and cares for his people. The Lord knows those who are his. False teachers and false teachings abound. Supposedly Christian television is full of perversions of biblical truth. Across Chattanooga and across the globe today, there will be people who are gathering in the name of Jesus who will be hearing things that are completely inconsistent with the word of God, completely inconsistent with the life and the teaching of Christ. Some of them will appeal to a legalism that says you've got to earn your way to heaven. You've got to earn your way to God. Some will paint God as this big, rosy, flowery being that doesn't care if you sin or not, who just loves everybody and, and just doesn't care what you're doing and just says, just live any old way you want to live. And at the end of it all, you'll all just come to be with me. So it doesn't really matter. Just do whatever you want to do. But for all of those teachers and teachings, including Hymenaeus and Philetus in that world, including those in our culture today, God is not for one singular moment confused about who belongs to him and who doesn't. God is not for one singular moment looking across Woodland Park and he's not certain about, I think she's mine or maybe she's mine, I don't know. I don't know if he or she is truly knows me, loves me. No, God knows exactly who are his because we belong to him, because he has rescued us, because he has saved us, because he has transformed us, because, because he has named us at his own. So that even as we saw last week in verse 13, even in moments of momentary faithlessness on Brian's part, God remains faithful. And so I'm going to arrive safely home, and I'm going to remain a part of his kingdom, and I'm a part of a, a, 
body of believers that is firm and secure and sound. I'm not talking about Woodland Park. I'm talking about the church universal. The church is safe and secure because we belong to him. He knows who we are, and he is watching over us day by day and moment by moment. Despite the opposition, despite the threats, the church will stand and the church marches forward. But the other thing he says is, secondly, that seal says, everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness or unrighteousness. The idea being that God's people display true holiness. And so the church stands firm, sure, well-founded, because on the Godward side, God chose us and we are his. And on the manward side, we are being transformed so that true believers are turning from sin and are turning to God and growing in Jesus Christ. The false teachers and their followers, uh, the word in here, they have been progressing. They're progressing in ungodliness. They're moving away from truth. They're moving farther and farther away from God, more and more into the world, looking more and more like the things of the world around them. But true believers, those who belong to God, those who have embraced the gospel, those who have responded and surrendered to him, those who have been called and set apart by God for his glory, those who have experienced that redemptive work that Stephen reminded us of today from Colossians, they have, they have been turned by Christ away from unrighteousness and turning to God, which is the very essence of holiness. Holiness is that I've turned to God, and in doing so, I turn away from the world. This is what God is doing in us if we truly belong to him. 2 Corinthians 5, Paul writes, the love of Christ controls us. Not, no longer our flesh. No, no, the love of Christ controls. It compels us having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Those who are truly saved, those who are indwelt by the Spirit of God, those who are born again have been turned away from the world and they've been turned to Christ and are drawn, compelled, controlled by his love to live differently. There is no such thing as an untransformed believer. He, he, well, you know this, Paul writes to the Philippians, I am confident of this very thing, Philippians 1.6. That he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. What God started in my heart on that day that I surrendered my life to Christ as Savior and King, he has promised that he will see it through to the end so that Brian Kinlaw will be made to look more and more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to arrive safely home. I am being transformed in the general movement of my life. You should see and we will see growth and maturing, not because of my grip on God, but because of God's grip on me. 1 Peter 1, Peter said, we are to be holy because it is written, you should be holy. God says, for I am holy. And so as a believer, listen, in the It's not Brian Kinlaw's life, nor yours. It's not I got saved here, and from that point until I get to heaven, like every day, it's just growth and maturing and never failing and never falling short and never being faithless, always making the right choice, always doing the right thing. It'd be awesome if that was the case, but it's not. We do have moments, and we do have days, and we do have seasons where we blow it. And my guess is that some of you could look back, I can, can look back over just this past week and you could easily see that there were moments where you should have spoken the truth and you didn't. Where you could have shared the gospel and you were silent. Where you could have spoken words of grace and life and hope over your kids or over your spouse or over your friends and you chose to respond in anger or frustration. So every moment of every day is not some banner moment where where I'm just upward and onward in everything in my life. But what I will tell you is this, that based on the authority of God's word, that in the general flow of my life, from a 30, I'm not talking about from a microscopic level, but I'm talking about from a 30,000 foot view, what you should see is that over years and over decades, and what you will see in the life of a true believer is that you or me, whoever it is that we are, being transformed so that more and more who we are is a reflection of who Jesus is. And if I'm not seeing a transformation, if there is no transformation, if I look back and all of my hopes and dreams of heaven and of God are pinned on some singular moment of emotion, I would suggest to you that you're in dangerous territory. 
The people of God are transformed by God so that over an extended period of time, more and more, God is at work in my life. And even through, listen, even through the hardest things you went through this week, if there were moments that you just want to ball up and, and cry, when you have been most disappointed and most hurt and most um, um, when you struggled at your greatest points in the past week or month or year, in those darkest of moments, listen, even in those moments, your foundation never once shook because God had his hold on you and God was even using those hard things to make you not happier but to make you holier, to make you like Jesus. The church isn't in danger the church isn't, for all of the distractions, for all of the lies, for all of the supposed people who, who profess things in the name of Jesus who do not reflect Jesus at all, for all the books and for all the websites and for all the TV stuff and for all the dangers and for everything in our culture that would pull us, the church stands firm, not because of our strength, but because we are his and because he is working in us to shape us after the likeness of his son. And that is where our hope is today. And we, we cling to that, and we, we praise God for that, and we sing to him, and we celebrate that because this is our hope, and this is our strength. So, again, when we first hear just live for Jesus and know the truth and tell other people that truth, that sounds really simple. That sounds really easy. That sounds like an easy touchdown. That sounds like an easy score in life. But then if you walk with Jesus very long at all, you find out very quickly that, that you, don't, you don't do so unopposed. There's a real enemy that wants to destroy you and your life and keep you from being transformed and keep others from knowing and trusting and following Jesus through your impact and influence. And so living out the gospel is hard. It's challenging. It brings pain, and at times it will bring suffering. And it's dangerous because it's like um, those false teachers are are like a cancer that take root and are destructive for you and for the people around you. Maybe you're here today and you've been drawn into those philosophies and into the ideas of the world, and, um, and maybe, you've never, maybe you've never submitted yourself to the truth of the Word of God. Maybe you've built your whole life on, on your own ideas and your own thoughts and on the world's patterns and the world's philosophies and the, the culture of the world around you. To do so is to build your life on sinking sand that cannot withstand the storms of life that is to be destructive to you and to the people around you. Maybe God in his grace has been opening your eyes in recent days to the beauty and the splendor and the majesty and the goodness of Jesus in such a way that today you would say, Jesus, I don't want to build my life on these things. I want to build my life on you, on the sure foundation of who you are and the truth of your word and allow you to do your work in me. And so, Jesus, I surrender to you. If that's the desire of your heart, then he will meet you right where you are. And you don't have to come to the front. You don't have to pray some highfalutin prayer. And you don't have to fill out some form. You simply have to call out to him in honesty and say, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And Jesus, you're the only one who can be that. And so I surrender to you. I give my life to you. I believe you died for me and you rose and you conquered death and you're alive. Now come and be the Lord and leader of my life. And if we crown him in humility and sincerity and brokenness and turn him, he will meet you where you are and he will give you life and hope today and he will begin his transforming work in you. You don't have to be good enough for him. He will transform you from the inside out as you surrender to him. After the service today, if you're say, man, I'd love to talk to somebody about that. I'll be right down front. I'd love to chat with you. Any of our pastors would be glad to talk with you. If you're more of the email person kind, then you can email us at hello at woodlandpark.org, and we'd be glad to begin a conversation with you. But I know finally that for most of you in this room, you would say that you're a believer, that you have given your life to Jesus. And I would just remind you, again, that no matter what your vocation, no matter what your career, your calling is to be a person who's following Jesus and helping other people find and follow Jesus. You may hate the Chattanooga area. 
You may hate your job or the school you're going to. The people you have to deal with daily may be the most frustrating people in your life. And it may be the person you wake up beside and it may be the person you look at in the mirror. But hear me clearly. God in his grace has placed you where you are with intentionality and with purpose. You are a son or a daughter of the Most High God who is his representative in that place and among those people to help them see the beauty and the splendor of Jesus as Jesus lives this life through you. That's your calling. That's your reason for existence. That's your purpose for being. Jesus, be Jesus in me. Jesus, reveal yourself in and through me. But to do that, then Paul's given us some clear things to be mindful of. And so as we wrap up this morning, I just want to invite you to to bow your heads and to close your eyes before the Lord.